What's up guys? It's Friday. And so you know what that means. It's what the fitness time. What the f And this week, we're talking about different forms of creatine. This is kind of a throwback episode, I suppose. Throwback in terms of the video we're discussing. Somebody sent me a message about Athlean X. What's up guys, Jeff Cavalier, AthleanX.com. Now, this isn't really a call out video because a lot of other people have made these claims too. I think I've gotten asked about Athlean X ever since I got into the YouTube community and nothing ever really jumped out at me as something that was like ridiculous or a wild claim or anything like that. And I know he's been involved in a bit of YouTube drama. Hey, me too. No hate for that. Somebody sent me a message and said, hey, you know, he really recommends creatine hydrochloride. Today I want to talk to you about creatine. One of his supplements has creatine hydrochloride in it, as well as buffered creatine. So I think he has a, a pre and a post, and one has creatine HCL and one has buffered creatine. In terms of our RX1, we have a form of creatine called creatine hydrochloride, and in our post-workout RX2, we have Creacolin. Now this video was from 2016. So if he's updated his views since then, I couldn't find anything, but if somebody has it, please send it to me and I'll make a follow-up video because I don't want to say things that are not true. However, there was some real uh, liberties taken with the claims in this video. One of the biggest things we have to understand is first off how creatine works. So when you supplement with creatine, most creatine supplements out there and the traditional one that's used is creatine monohydrate or uh, creatine anhydrous. And when you supplement with it, you digest it, it goes through your intestine, your bloodstream, goes to your muscles, and once it's incorporated into your muscle, it becomes phosphocreatine, or, or most of the creatine in your muscle is stored as phosphocreatine. And most of the creatine in your body is stored in your muscle. Now, creatine can improve performance in several ways, one of which being it acts as a high energy phosphate donor to replenish ATP, ATP being your body's energy currency that you use during exercise and pretty much any kind of movement. So creatine has actually been shown to improve performance by acting as a phosphate donor to replenish ATP during high intensity exercise. It also increases intracellular water and increases lean body mass and strength. So there's a lot of benefits there that we're even showing it's got some cognitive benefits as well, which is pretty amazing. First point I wanna make is that creatine monohydrate has been shown to saturate the muscle cell 100% with phosphocreatine and creatine. You cannot get better than 100%. Now, to be fair, in the video, Jeff, our athlete X, says, you know, these products are not gonna give you better results than creatine monohydrate. It's gonna give you the same benefits of a creatine monohydrate in terms of performance. So at least there's that, that's great. Now, my next question is, then why are we using them? <laughs> and a lot of what he says has to do with talking about, for example, with creatine hydrochloride, the fact that it is more soluble than creatine monohydrate, which is true. Creatine hydrochloride is more soluble. Now he kind of takes this and uses that to say, well, see, since this is more soluble, you're gonna absorb more of it. Creatine now becomes a lower, more acidic compound. That's a good thing because what it, is, it does actually is it increases the, the absorbability and its ability to be absorbed in your intestines. Okay, so there's a few things to break down with this. First off, creatine hydrochloride is bonded to an acid. Hydrochloride's an acid. Your stomach is six molar hydrochloric acid. And while creatine hydrochloride is more soluble in water than creatine monohydrate, once they enter your stomach, where they're exposed to six molar hydrochloric acid, acid has been shown to increase creatine solubility. And creatine is stable in stomach acid. So you're likely gonna have not huge differences in solubility once it hits the stomach. Now, Jeff says in the video that I watched that if you mix in creatine monohydrate in water, you can see a lot of it goes to the bottom as sediment. <laughs> that sediment is gonna be what gets to your intestines. You'll notice that when, when you mix creatine monohydrate, a lot of times it sinks right to the bottom and it looks like sand on the bottom. That's sort of a microcosm of what actually winds up happening in a lot of people when they take creatine monohydrate. That same sediment winds up making its way into your intestines. That is a big leap. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the stomach in terms of not necessarily enzymatic digestion other than protein, but because of the stomach acid and the churning nature of the stomach, you mix up most of what you've eaten into what's called chyme. 
It's an acidic mixture. And it's very unlikely that that sediment is gonna reach the small intestine. And he kind of says, well, since that reaches the small intestine, your small intestine has to pull in water to dilute that. And that's why some people get cramping with creatine or specifically with creatine monohydrate. And trying to be absorbed, you know, calling in more water to try to help with that absorption, which winds up bloating you and giving you that bloated feeling if you've ever experienced that with regular creatine monohydrate. First off, there's no evidence of that. Second off, the reason that most people get cramping or gastrointestinal distress from creatine monohydrate is when they load creatine, when they're taking a very large dosage of creatine, about 20 grams per day, which has been shown to saturate the muscle cells faster, but you don't need to do that. You can just take three to five grams a day and over the course of a month, you'll become saturated. When you're loading, because you're taking such a large amount of creatine, it's decreasing the absolute amount you're absorbing or the percentage that you're absorbing. And so you can get some gastrointestinal discomfort. Most people don't load creatine HCL because it's expensive. So when we look at creatine monohydrate versus creatine HCL, let's say that creatine monohydrate has less solubility than creatine HCL, even in stomach acid, during digestion, all that kind of stuff. The amount of creatine monohydrate needed to saturate the muscle cell versus creatine hydrochloride on a per dosage cost is about four times less. So even if all this stuff is true, it still doesn't make sense in my opinion to use creatine hydrochloride because it simply just costs more for the same outcome. That being said, I suppose it's in the realm of possibilities that you do require a lower amount of creatine HCL compared to monohydrate to get the same results. You don't have to load with 20 grams anymore and you don't have to maintain dosages of five grams anymore. And if that's the case, and if you're somebody who anecdotally has a lot of trouble with creatine monohydrate, in terms of bloating or gastrointestinal discomfort, maybe creatine hydrochloride could be for you. That's gonna be a pretty small subset of the population. Now, in his other product, he talked about having buffered creatine. Now, buffered creatine is something I definitely have a problem with because there's a little more research on this. And once again, it shows that buffered creatine was not better than creatine monohydrate at increasing muscle creatine stores. Because what he says is, and I'm paraphrasing, with these forms of creatine, being buffered creatine and HCL, you don't have to cycle it because you're not having a buildup of creatinine. The, the need to not have to cycle on and off. Some people, again, will say that you wanna cycle because of the buildup of creatinine on and off of creatine monohydrate. You don't have to do that here. You're getting all those benefits, the same level of benefit and performance without having to have that. What? <laughs> so, physiology. Um, creatinine does not build up. You excrete it in your urine. Uh, if it built up, we got problems, all right? So that's one thing. The other thing is, I, I don't wanna say there's no evidence that you should cycle creatine. They have shown that the creatine receptor can downregulate when you supplement with creatine. However, that doesn't mean that you need to cycle creatine and here's why. Even if the receptor downregulates, you would have to see loss of intramuscular creatine stores to actually make it sense for you to cycle creatine. So just because the receptor downregulates, once you've saturated the muscle cell, that doesn't mean that you're losing creatine out of the muscle cell. And that has nothing to do with creatinine levels. So I don't know why he said that. It doesn't make sense from a physiology perspective. And there's no evidence to back that up that I'm aware of, unless he wants to show me some or somebody else can show me some and then I'll see if I can stick my foot in my mouth, but pretty sure I won't have to. Now, the other thing he said was, you know, I have these two supplements so you can take one pre-workout and one post-workout so you can get the benefits of creatine pre-workout and post-workout. You can get it pre-workout to sort of benefit and increase your performance during the workout. And then other studies would argue that it's better to take after your training to sort of help replenish that. The vast majority, if not all of creatine's benefits are not from a acute usage. It's not like you take a dose of creatine and all of a sudden, boom, you're stronger, got better fatigue resistance, all that kind of stuff. It's from the accumulation of intramuscular creatine stores and that takes time. Now you can do it faster if you're taking it and loading it, but it's still a time dependent issue. It's not like caffeine where you take it one time and boom, you get an effect. So overall, was this the worst series of claims I've ever seen? Definitely not. In fact, I just saw a TikTok video today where somebody Somebody said that uh, you don't absorb water well because the water that's out there on the market is large molecules and what you need is small water molecules.
So I'm, I, if that person graduated high school, this is an utter failure of our education system because this is just basic chemistry. In any case, so not the worst claims I've ever seen, but definitely some misunderstandings about creatine metabolism, creatinine metabolism, and just kind of physiology in general. Now, full disclosure, I have a supplement line, Outward Nutrition. One of our products, Recovery, has creatine monohydrate in it. So there is my bias. I am open to anyone who can cite literature that says that hydrochloride is superior to monohydrate in peer-reviewed research. I have not seen it, and none of the proposed mechanisms make sense to me, especially when we come back to the fact that creatine monohydrate saturates the muscle cell 100%. Creatine hydrochloride can work, buffered creatine can work, but you're gonna pay more for them. If you like really expensive creatine, go right ahead. But if you want the best bang for your buck, creatine monohydrate is your best bet. I've been in this industry 20 years. I've seen every different form of creatine you can think of come out. Creatine citrate, creatine pyruvate, creatine ethyl ester, buffered creatine, creatine hydrochloride, and a laundry list of others that I could name off. There's a reason creatine monohydrate is the creatine that is used in all the studies and the most well-studied because it works and because it's cheap. Now, when something's available ubiquitously, what happens to the price and the profit margins? They go way down, okay? Remember flat screen TVs like around the year 2008? I remember buying a 42 inch LCD TV for 1200 bucks. You go to Amazon right now and get it for like a packet of gum for a 42 inch screen. I'm exaggerating, obviously. What happened? You had a lot of people making the same stuff. The technology to make it got better. And because of competition, the margins went way down. Now, what's a way you can increase your margins? Have different forms of creatine that you can try to justify having people pay more for. So I'm not speaking to Jeff's intent. Maybe he really believes the stuff he's saying. What I'm saying is it doesn't appear to be supported by the data. All right, guys, hope you liked the What the Fitness. Make sure you like and subscribe to the video and get in the comments and tell me how wrong I am because you love Ashley next and damn it, Lane, don't pick on him. And I'll catch you next week.